Aloha and welcome to What's Bugging You, brought to you by Hawaii's leader in pest control and the first company in Hawaii to earn the National Quality Pro Certification, Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Now, here's the host of our show, Mike Buck. Aloha and welcome once again to What's Bugging You. You know, the thing is, you have to learn to live with pests, but not in your house. You know, I mean, they're everywhere. And this program is being brought to you in an informative way by our friends at Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Michael, both have been in the business a long time. And we, uh, every week, bring you this program, and we point you at the at the website, sandwichisle.com. And we normally start things off by saying, how do you do? And that's what we're going to do today and the news of the week. Uh, and, and first of all, Michael, uh, we're doing this because you're actually on the road today. So telephonically, we're, uh, we're hooked up together. Ain't technology grand? Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. But I'll tell you, it's because uh, there's so many pests. Uh, buzzing around right now that I can't make it into the studio. So, well, you know, uh, I, what, what, what I understand, your time's not your own anymore. I mean, you know, uh, and, and that's good, but by the same token, aren't we all like instant gratification? Once somebody identifies a problem, aren't they all over wanting to get it fixed? Yeah, you know, the new the new standard is when somebody calls, they expect to be serviced, they expect a response immediately, they don't expect to get called back, they want the job scheduled <laughs> when they're on the original phone call and they want the job done that day or the next day. So this is the new standard in the service industry. Um, people are so used to getting what they want so quickly, and there's so many choices that if they don't get the, what they want straight away, yeah, they're down the road. work your way out of business. Yeah. yeah, but you know, the thing is, what we've got here is in Sandwich Isle, at dealing with a serious condition. I mean, you know, a leak in the faucet's terrible, uh, but, uh, you know, a kid covered with bed bud bikes. And so, and so we always start off the, the program with, with what, what was on the, on the, in the, the lead column of pests this week. And last week you said, ah, for some reason, bed bugs aren't around right now. Yeah, isn't that amazing? So um, <clears throat> last week we were talking about how amazingly bed bugs suddenly just disappeared off the radar. There, there were hardly any bed bug calls. And then this week, completely overwhelmed with bed bugs. So we're getting bed bug calls from, from every sector you can imagine, from retail, from uh, residential, uh, commercial, um, even rental cars. I mean, we, we've pretty much got calls from all over the place this week, probably four or five times our regular number of calls for bed bugs. So I, I really don't understand how it happens. It might just be coincidental mm-hmm. or it might be larger cycles, but not only bed bugs, but rats. So... Um, Rats right now um, have are the second most common call, and what I assume is happening is that, for example, the fruits that are dropping, lychees right now, mangoes just did drop, um, avocados are dropping right now. So whenever there's a lot of an abundance of fruit or food around people's homes, it draws in um, critters from all over the place. So particularly the um, roof rat that we have um, that loves the fruit, and then they go from the fruit trees jumping onto the roof of the house. Yeah, and we've talked before about we've talked before Michael about the importance of of landscape management. I mean, pest management uh, can be aided by landscape management. If you don't build a bridge into your house, uh, these rats are likely to stay outside. Knock on wood. That, that's right, Mike. And you know, we, we normally start off with a section on on um, pests in the news, and I'll, I'll just tell you a story from yesterday. My, my son actually went to a beach park <clears throat> where they had a school, um, like a whole day on the beach, type of a thing. And uh, one of the kids was a, a girl with long hair was was lying down in the sand right near some leaves under a tree, and started screaming. Turns out a centipede crawled from the leaves into her hair and oh. bit her twice in different areas oh. on her head before they could pull Jeez. it out of her hair. Now, <laughs> well, you know, can now you listen, imagine? Michael. Michael, <laughs> what a nightmare. We, we've, we're, we're talking about this, and it's going to be a moment in our lives, and we forget. But that little girl who got bitten a couple of times at the beach by a centipede is never going to forget. You know, and it's funny, I said to my son, when I dropped off at school, I said, Mikey, just remember now, whenever you go to a beach park or anything like that, he loves to climb trees. I said, just be careful of scorpions, be careful of centipedes, oh, always geez. look where you put your hands and your feet. And uh, then he, when I pick him up yesterday, he tells me the story and how this poor kid was just devastated. But anyway, so that, that's that's uh, minor news. But the big news is Hawaii legislator, uh, legislative, um, I believe they just finished, um, there were a bunch of different bills introduced, uh, some related to pest control. But one that I thought is particularly interesting is that a bill was introduced to set aside a bunch of money to hire someone to help to eradicate the growing problem with the coffee berry borer. 
um, which is a major coffee pit. You know, um, Michael, I must tell you, you're right. You know, I do a, w- a weekly wrap up of the ledge, and they are done. And that bill that you're talking about, normally, and I say this all the time, I, I I'm a I'm a real fiscal conservative, and I don't like government spending because they've usually shown that they're they're behind the curveball. But in in the in this area, in the area of 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 quarantine and pest and all of these things. It really does. It really is important. And look at the industry that is being threatened with these things. Yeah, you know exactly. If you if you think about it, you, the um, University of Hawaii, <clears throat> I believe that they just came out and, and recognized that the coffee berry borer beetle. It's a beetle that actually um, infests the fruit of the coffee, and then the larvae eat the seed. So that the when when the the fruit is harvested, they take off the cherry, which is the outside. And then the seed, which is the inside, which becomes roasted and, and then becomes coffee, ground up as coffee, the seed can be completely diminished by the larva that feeds upon it. Oh, or geez. it just loses its value because it's, it's, it's insect damaged. Now, when you consider coffee prices, c- coffee is a highly traded commodity, and, and I believe that Kona coffee may be in the top three most valuable coffees in the world. Yeah, in, the, in the world. And, you know, we are – it's interesting because, uh, uh, folks, you've learned in, in the past that Michael Botha came from originally South Africa, and South Africa kind of mirrors us with regards to climate and pest and everything else, and that's why all these generations of, of pest control uh, work so well in Hawaii. But it's interesting because we are the only state commercially growing coffee, and, and it just dawned on me when you started talking about that, uh, does South Africa grow coffee? Um, you know they do, but it's not not nearly as well known as it is over here. You, you know you have Kenya, and it's more East Africa. So, okay. Yeah. Um, you know Africa is, is is huge, and and so the area that's most like Hawaii um, and some of the tropical regions where coffee is grown, yeah, like Jamaica, for example, they have that Blue Mountain coffee. Is the eastern part of Africa, um, east of the Great Escarpment, which is this giant mountain range, sure. coastal mountain range, and uh, so Kenya is very famous for its coffee, um, but. Um, yeah, this this uh, we, we've been involved in the whole coffee berry borer uh, treatment program. We actually own and run the coffee berry borer treatment center in Kona and have done so for the last five years. Since Michael, the second it, day it, it came out is is it doable? I do know that it's probably a breath of fresh air knowing that the government is going to do this because obviously they're realizing that it's a part of the three legged stool is uh, is is you know tourism, military, and agriculture, and we really do have a shot at growing this coffee business and the macadamia nut business, but all of them are susceptible to pests. That's right. You know, um, until I started becoming involved with the Department of Agriculture um, on, on, a, on a close in a close way, we, we've always been policed by them. But recently, mm-hmm. I was elected to a position where I'm I'm sitting on the Pesticide Advisory Board. And, and until I really got to know some of these guys, I didn't realize what an awesome job our Department of Agriculture in Hawaii does. So I think to answer your question, can we make an impact? I think that if the Hawaii Department of Agriculture decides that they want to do something. You can bet that they'll make an impact. They're probably one of the most effective government units that I've ever worked with. These guys are some of the smartest guys out there, and they're motivated to really do a good job. You you may remember back when we met each other years ago and we did some television together that we met uh, one of the epidemiologists from the state, and they really were on it back then. And and I shudder to think uh, where we would be with, without all of this help and with all of this uh, all, all of the prevention that we can now embrace based on what the, the information they gathered. That's right, Mike. And, you know, we, we've covered a lot on, on invasive species in uh, the prior shows. And invasive species, um, that's another whole story. But if it weren't for uh, Department of Agriculture inspectors intercepting these things, for example, the Brazilian wandering spider, which is the world's most, most venomous spider that they just intercepted, um, we would have all kinds of pests um, coming over to Hawaii and proliferating and taking over from the native fish. Uh, on the subject of that, we, we also uh, we, we have to touch upon the, the last week in, in, in the termite industry because, from what I understand, they are in full bloom this summer already. Holy moly, Mike. So we, last night and Wednesday night on Oahu, we had the strongest swarms of the year. And I'm talking where lights are, there's clouds of termites around the street lights. And uh, everyone in the neighborhood has the lights out. So let me tell you a story. So last night, <clears throat> I started running, just trying to get back in shape again. So I'm running up Pupakea Road, 
And, of course, I never had a flashlight with me, and it gets dark. So I'm running back oh, as geez. the termites are swarming. I hear it coming. I, yeah. I felt like, like, like Rocky or someone were, like <laughs> running and punching ahead. So I'm thinking, like, I wasn't punching. I was slapping the termites out of my way because oh, I'm running. Goodness. And literally there's thousands of them. Every time you breathe, they... <laughs> so I'm hitting them out the way. And finally, I gulp a breath of fresh air and fresh termites, man. I must have swallowed, I don't know, half a dozen of them. I end up on my knees, coughing and spluttering, almost throwing up because I got the termites squirming down my neck. You know what? And, I, uh, I, I, I find ironic. What a choking hazard! I, I find it it's so ironic. That these termites obviously didn't know who they were dealing with. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if if, if if Joe Average Citizen gets swarmed, but you say, you know what? I'm done with you guys. I'm going to fix this part of my street. <laughs> hey, you know what? This morning I sent out five fumigation trucks, and we're going to kill so many termites today. It's not funny. <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's like I said in the, in the introdu- introduction to the show, Michael. I mean, we are in the tropics. We do have bugs and pests. They have a, a place in the food chain. Uh, there, there's a degree of importance on all of them. But what we really have to do is protect the assets, and that's where management comes in. That's exactly right, Mike. <clears throat> no. Okay, so that being said... Uh, it it's an eye opener, literally. I mean, it, now at least people can say that we're not baying at the moon. The moon is baying back. There's bugs everywhere. <laughs> There's bugs everywhere, yeah. and uh, keep your mouth closed when you're running yeah. through too much swamp. Michael, you sent you know Michael and I always exchange notes before we do one of these shows. That you sent me something today that that talks about uh, you know this IPM, the, the view, your view of the world, what in the world is IPM? It's some, is it some industry, uh, uh, you know, uh, acronym or what? You know, so the, the, the term IPM, which stands for Integrated Pest Management, is a term that's been around since the 70s after that book from Rachel Carson, The Silent Spring, came out. Mm-hmm. That's when pest management companies as a group decided they needed to band together and they needed to find a better way of applying pesticides so that we just didn't randomly spray um, baseboards and, and do things mechanically. Rather, we uh, provided a lot more um, thought and, and, and developed a process, um, a common sense approach um, to controlling pests that didn't just mean spraying everything like with a shotgun. Um, so integrated pest management basically is focused upon finding the best strategy for a pest problem, not just the simplest strategy, which might be just spraying mm-hmm. or tent fumigation. Um, and we never employ a one-size-fits-all approach. Basically, every unique situation is looked at and you inspect, you know, identify what the pest is, inspect the situation, and then develop a program that works specifically for that area. Yeah, so you know, pain- what, what, one thing I learned from, from you on that, two things. Uh, first of all, you, you can treat it like you treat your body. And what I'm interested in is letting people know that the industry responded to, to to this set of guidelines before it was mandated that they did so. In other words, you all saw it coming. And instead of just spraying everything, which you know is going to kill everything, oh, yeah, pest guys came, killed everything. Uh, you thought, well, maybe we don't want to kill everything. Maybe we just want to get the bad guys. So let's work on management. That's right, Mike. And I'll tell you, um, the National Pest Management Association is an incredible association. It's made up of many members in the pest management industry internationally. So it's called the National Association, but it's actually an international association. And it's a self-policing organization where, you know, they form Quality Pro, for example, which is one of the things that, that we're, yeah, we're the you, first you just been, Quality yeah, Pro. Yeah, lovely. And basically it's, it's setting a whole new set of standards that are over and above anything set by state or federal guidelines. And so the industry as a group banded together and said, listen, we need to reinvent ourselves because we'll all be out of business if we don't adopt a new strategy. So they came up with integrated pest management. And basically the treatment options in IPM can vary from proactive measures like seeding cracks and removing food and water sources mm-hmm. to reactive measures such as using pest products. It doesn't exclude the use of pest products, but what it does do, it uses pest control um, applications as the last solution and all of the others as the first solution. So in it's in a other words, it, it, way of doing it. are you saying that what you what you do is maybe you have a set of guidelines that you're gonna that you're gonna go to, to a situation and find out all right where in this where in this big picture is this particular situation? In other words, instead of rolling out the big bo- the big bomb and spraying everything inside, maybe we shoot orange oil into this house instead of tent it. You know what I'm getting at? Exactly, Mike. And, and you know, there's a, when you think about integrated there's many different types of things Mm -hmm. that work better when you have an integrated approach when you use more than one thing Um, and so it's a very sensible approach that we've actually applied to many different things including our our, our 
wildlife management, feral pig management. Basically, we use a multiple different types of activities and, and focus a lot on inspection and mechanical things rather than just application. Yeah, I think that's very clearly very, very important, gang. And we want you to know that at any time, whenever you hear something you want to know more about, I want to guide you at sandwichisle.com. That's triple W sandwich, S-A-N-D-W-I-C-H, Isle, I-S-L-E, dot com, because there's a myriad of information. Michael's people keep working on, on doing much better job on that. But I think that this this whole thing of management is something that people really need to embrace. In other words, to find out you likened it in the notes you sent me. Uh, everybody that's overweight can't lose weight and get fit the same way. It, it, you know, you, there's all kinds of different processes. Okay, so here's here's the correlation that I see it. And now bear in mind that the title for this section was "The World According to Michael." So <clears throat> everyone uh, has their own opinions, of course, and this is my opinion. So I see a correlation between integrated pest management and weight management, just like managing pests. It's very hard to manage your weight if you use only one control method. Yep. Okay, now you know a lot about losing weight because when I first met you, Mike, you were over 500 pounds. That's right. I was and a and today, <laughs> today you look like you're 30 and you're, what, 200 pounds? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, um, the thing is, you're right. and it, It's to the point where everybody thinks, well, I'll just not, I just won't eat rice. Good luck. I mean, you know, there's, 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 no, there's no fast fix to anything. No, you're exactly right, Mike. And let me, let, me, let me tell you how I put this in perspective. So um, I, I recently had an injury uh, about, about two months ago and uh, injured both, the, both my knees and, and an ankle, uh, which, which resulted in me not being able to do the things I normally do, like walk on the beach or run on the beach and walk my dogs, that type of thing. And so I, I reduced my eating a little bit to try and accommodate for the fact that I wasn't as active. But the reduced calorie consumption did not offset the effect of the reduced exercise. So I just began packing on the pounds. I put on like 20 pounds in seven weeks. Oh, jeez. So, I mean, this is amazing, right? So I used to be able to do that in seven minutes. But those, <laughs> those are the good old days. <laughs> but so, so the point of this is that um, I tried to do one thing, but it didn't solve the problem. I, I reduced my, my consumption, but it didn't make any difference. The fact that I had reduced my exercise, that one solution wasn't going to help anything. So what I did was I found new ways to exercise around the injuries, using more of an integrated approach, kind of like pest control, yep. um, and of both reducing the calories and increasing the exercise, and that provided the balance that I needed, and, and in fact, to the point where I could actually lose weight if I want to. Okay, and that's that's where I hope everybody listening to the program buys into this, because I think, and we, and we need to talk about this in a way that you, you have such a process in vetting out uh, new people and training them and getting them so that they can come on a home and make an assessment, and, and then you can do out this list of things. And that brings me up uh, to another thing. You, you know, we've talked before, and, and we need to address it a little bit again, but isn't that half the deal, having the right technician go out and triage an area and decide, okay, here's, here, here are the things you can do, homeowner. Here's what we, we recommend. What do you think? Mike, there's, there's a saying that we have internally. You cannot have a happy customer unless you have a happy technician. Hey, that's and a good uh, yeah. so, so in terms of hiring, uh, we hire every day. So I've already had two applicants come in early this morning <clears throat> and, uh, that we met. And it's a constant battle to try and find the right people. The key thing is attitude. The number one thing we look for is attitude. Do, they, do their values align with ours? Do they have the integrity to know and do what's right, even when no one's, no one's watching. And uh, th- that's the key thing is to having people whose values align with you. Well, um, I can tell you from personal experience with your guys over the years that, that the, the home run is that they know that they have the applied technology and the, and the, and the backup when they come back to you or somebody else back at the back of the shop and say, hey, we tried this, it didn't work, what can we do next? That down the road, the, 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 the happy customer is pretty much guaranteed. I mean, if, if you come in and assess the situation, pretty much you're going to fix it. It is guaranteed. Um, and we, we always offer a money-back guarantee. So even if we fail and the person doesn't like it, we'll give them their money back. But um, you're right. You know, what, what, after 18 years, we've begun to figure some things out. Yeah. So, <laughs> it took a long, bumpy ride to get you. But, you know, what we realized is that our management team is not, uh, is not there to police our employees. Our manager team needs to look at our employees as our customers because they're our customers too. We serve them. And so it's this whole cultural shift that we made a few years ago where we realized that our employees are 
as in, the, the person that does the work in the field is as important as the top person in the company. There's, there's no one more important than the person actually delivering the service. And that the role of the management is not to chase after people, but it's to support them so that they can achieve their goals. And, yeah, and, what a big difference. It's not, you know, you better watch out. The boss might come by, and, 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 and it might be instead... You're really lucky because the boss is going to come by. You know, you're going to you're going to you're going to actually not just get supervision, but suggestions. What does that mean, though? That means when you say you're hiring all the time. I know the other day you you got a couple of more trucks. You're very busy right now, so you, this is an ongoing process. There still are ways that people can come and check out sandwichisle dot com and find out if there's a, there's a job for them. Yeah, you know, Mike. Um, people often ask us, "Well, how come you guys are running nine ads?" The, the truth is, we're growing at fifteen percent per month. Um, yeah, so how can you do when, that without when, adding more people and trucks, right? Yeah, when you yeah. grow at 15% per month, you double the size of your company in four years. <laughs> <laughs> so you go from 80 to 160 people. You know, So, so the, the reality behind that is that in order to hire one person, it takes us about 10 applicants that, that actually get to their second interview. Um, so it, it might take 100 applicants to get one that actually gets to the first interview. So, <clears throat> you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. And... Um, where we failed in the past was we didn't dedicate sufficient time to planning ahead for our growth, and so we we're constantly not having enough people to go around. Now, now with constantly being proactive and trying to recruit people, by the time we hire them, we need them. Yeah, and, so, and by the way, gang, it is such an honorable profession only because I want to tell you that the satisfaction at the end of the day when somebody has come up and said, thank you so much, my kid's not getting bitten anymore, uh, that's got to be worth the, all of the hassles they go through. That's exactly it. So, I mean, think about this. The top four ways pest management professionals improve the lives of everyone in Hawaii. Number one, we, prefer, we protect property from damage. Mm-hmm. In the U.S., $5 billion a year is Jeez. done in damage. In uh-huh. Hawaii, UH estimated over $100 million in, a year is, is done in damage, just termite damage. Um, yes. But then you have other damage. You have termites, you have rodents, you have carpenter bees, and... Uh, you know, carpenter bees cause all kinds of damage to um, handrails and eaves and that type of thing. Rodents gnaw through everything and cause fires. Um, you know, the second thing is pest professionals keep us safe from health threats. We've discussed in previous episodes mosquitoes and the diseases associated with them and other types of flies, um, dengue, dengue disease, malaria, all of those things. Um, well, pest professionals keep everyone safe from that type of thing. Rodents have hantavirus. We had a client in Molokai who suffered from hantavirus caused from mice. Jeez. And, and so this is real. This is in Hawaii. Well, pest management professionals control rodents so that you don't have those problems. And then just as I mentioned yesterday, centipedes, scorpions, um, they, they're terrible things to have. And, you know, this poor kid yesterday, this girl has a, a centipede in her hair. Well, you don't have to deal with that at home. If you can control your environment at home and have a pest control service, we can make sure there aren't any centipedes or scorpions. Yeah, and, and, and on that subject, gang, I want to remind everybody that the, the, the actual title of today's program is uh, The Best Way to Keep the Pest at Bay, not in in Hanama Bay, but at bay outside your property. <laughs> Selecting the best uh, the best control solution is what we're going to talk about right after you, uh, you hear how to get in touch with everybody at Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Why do you need pest prevention? My home is very important to me. The last thing I want to worry about are bugs and centipedes around my wife and kids. Your home is your castle. Our customers want to keep their homes free of unwanted pests. That's why they hire Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. There are many homes out there that are going to get rodents. We used to live in fear of centipedes and roaches. You need to protect your house, and Sandwich Isle protects ours. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it. At Sandwich Isle, we believe the best way to protect your home from unwanted pests is not through control, but through prevention. Pest prevention is a unique concept perfected by Sandwich Isle in 1997. Over the years, we have continued to improve our service effectiveness with the many technological advances in our industry. Today, Sandwich Isle's pest prevention is recognized as one of the most environmentally responsible and effective approaches in the industry. Expect more and get it with Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Okay, so, you know, officially summertime is all over us. I know you got your honeydew list. Well, you better uh, be be doing your your honey pest list, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, a little bit today, uh, Michael. The interesting thing about this is that it, the the harbinger of summer coming is is a big wake up call because that means more people outside, more hassles. That that's exactly right, Mike. Um, so 
as we get these nice warm temperatures and increased humidity, um, a lot of the pests that were more dormant or less active in winter, they begin swarming and becoming more active, which is why we see more of them. They're actually there year-round, but they just become more visible. For example, the termite swarms that we, we, we were talking about earlier. Well, you know, it, it just so happens that, you know, here we are looking into this weekend, and at the same time, uh, from the Big Island, we got Vogue. I mean, you know, every single change in atmosphere that also you've said correlates to a change in what pests manifest and how they come out. That, that's exactly right. You know, there's a lot of things that people can do. And uh, so let's talk about some of the things that, that I would recommend um, people do to help keep pests out of their house. In other words, being proactive, doing something being, on their own. Being proactive. Yeah. And, and really, we, we were talking about integrated pest management earlier. Mm-hmm. Integrated pest management starts with you, the homeowner. The homeowner is part of that equation. They have to assist with the process, otherwise it won't work. So, for example, pulling uh, mulch away from the house at least 20 foot away, that removes the area that the little Pacific beetle roaches like to live in. And when they live there, centipedes who feed on them also like to live there. And so now if you have mulch up against the side of your house, you not only have the roaches close to your house, but you Mm -hmm. also have their predators, (laughs) which will easily get their way into the house if they want to. Um, So seating cracks and holes, entry points for utility lines and around uh, screen doors and screen windows, around eaves. Um, Centipedes particularly will will often climb up a wall and go in through the eaves. Uh, People don't think they climb, but they actually go straight up the wall and they'll go in through the, the eaves where the birds have pecked out the little screens, and then they'll walk around in the ceiling until they find a cutout, which is normally a light or a fan. They'll walk, get to the cutout, climb down, drop off into the fan, get thrown off or drop onto a light, and then jump out. And uh, that's how people get bitten in their beds. Often they're actually Jeez. coming from the ceiling, not from the bottom. Yeah, very, very persistent. As a matter of fact, somebody said, but people don't believe that how roaches fly. They think, you know, uh, we got these, these giant 747 flying cockroaches for heaven's sake. American cockroaches, man, they're huge over here, too. If, and if, they, if they're on your ceiling or on your, and maybe your fans, maybe you have an overhead fan and it's not on, and there's a roach up on top of it, you could have one in your mouth in the middle of the night, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. Oh, I know you hear that stuff all the time. Yeah, we do. We had a customer call us, and the woman woke up with a roach in her bed, oh, and it was crawling on her. She completely freaked out. She, and so that's an example of a customer who called in and, and not only wanted the problem solved, she, she wanted it scheduled the same day. She yeah, wanted you know, person, and, <laughs> and we were out there the same day, so she wouldn't have to sleep with a roach in her bed. And, and you know, I can't <laughs> tell you how many spouses uh, will get yelled at in the middle of the night. Someone will just say, roach! You know, and it's, it's like, I'm supposed to wake up find an implement and, and attack this thing. And by the way, the roach is long gone. They figure you all out, don't they? I'll tell you something, Mike. I would much rather hear the word roach than centipede, man. Oh, because yeah. there's nothing. <laughs> I've been bit three times in the bed, each time whilst I was on vacation somewhere. Oh, my. And uh, I used to go fishing in Molokai all the time. And, I, you know, I woke up one night with a centipede. I was lying on my back, crawling up my stomach. And yikes, uh, yikes, uh, yikes. it was uh, they're terrible, man. I can't stand those things. But anyway, getting back to what people can do. Uh, tree branches, uh, shrubbery and trim, cut that away from the structure. If you have a crawl space, make sure it's ventilated and it's dry. Mm-hmm. Roaches especially absolutely love damp crawl spaces. So make sure that if you have a crawl space, make sure it's ventilated. Um, store garbage in sealed um, containers and dispose of regularly. If you have that slime that sometimes develops in your big gray trash can outside, when you dump it and it's empty, take it over to the spigot, tilt it upside. I'm sorry? Uh, I, 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 and water doesn't go in if it rains. Yeah, for for a second we lost you there, Michael. We got to the uh, tipping the uh, tipping the the can over. By the way, there was somebody doing that for a while. Isn't it just a good idea to have to, to sort of maintain the inside of that gray can and, and even the green can? Do something about it. Don't let it build up that sludge in the bottom. Yeah, you need to turn it on the side and clean that out because what happens is flies breed in decaying organic matter. Now that is decaying organic matter. Oh so. yeah. You could have tens of thousands of flies breeding inside that, and then it stinks and it attracts all the roaches and rodents and everything in the area too. So um, that's always a good idea. Um, repairing damaged wood. Um, if you have rotten wood, like maybe some deck boards or an eave or something might be getting too much water exposure, a leaking gutter perhaps, um, and you have rotting wood, well, rotting wood is like a magnet to insects. So they love it. So you know, you have all kinds of ants and termites. Everything will move in there, including subterranean termites, which could live in rotting wood that does not have contact to the ground because there's sufficient moisture in it. Um, Most of the things that you've mentioned so far 
are 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 pretty much do it yourself projects being vigilant uh yeah. you know mitigating things like the branches like you're talking about uh, m- making sure that that crawl space is not moist and everything else but then there comes a point uh in everybody where they they've done all of these things and they still have a problem and they just now are really puzzled they really don't know what to do and that's where we come in so you know we 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 try to help people as much as possible by telling them what they can do. But at some point, you have to realize that you're not going to win the battle on your own, and you need to bring in an army to, to, to clean out the enemy. And that, that's, where, that's what we do. So when, when you've got to the point where you need the problem solved for good, that's when you call a company like ours, and we'll come out there, we'll analyze the situation, we'll develop an IPM program for that specific situation, and we'll wipe them out. Well, I can tell you, I've been watching lately some of your television commercials and seeing the, the, the widespread number of endorsements. And I think it's because of the exponential growth of Sandwich Isle uh, over the last several years that you're able to embrace and, and add another, add more ammunition to your, to your, to your cartridge belt as far as the things that you've got, the things that you can contain. But most of us aren't we involved in the ones that you're talking about, termites, roaches, ants, and, and other bugs from the yard? Yeah, we are. You know, Mike, this is our business. We're, we're passionate about this. You know, we've got now 87 people who live and breathe pest management every day. And we're proud of who we are. We're proud of the, the job that we do. And we're in an awesome industry. When you think about it, as a company, we're involved in the pest management business from agriculture, importation, distribution, wholesale, retail, and then all the, the residential and, contra- on, and commercial after that. So we're involved from the point of view of working with farmers. Um, when, when things get imported and they, they get uh, quarantined, we deal with it there. Distribution, we work in warehouses. We work in grocery stores. Um, we, we work uh, in retail stores, um, all kinds of restaurants from fast food to, to, to the large uh, grocery you know chains it's just amazing so we have, a, we have an incredible business and uh, our guys are really passionate but I, I want to talk about one thing Mike um, that's that I see as a potential problem for homeowners who might want to take care of things themselves and what I'd like to talk about real quickly is pesticides in the homes I'm sure you've heard about some nightmare stories about kids and, and, and animals maybe and even adults who have encountered pesticides in homes Mike yeah, and you know, not only that, Michael, but I think there's another thing, and maybe you can incorporate this into what you're going to say, and that is a lot of us, uh, because of time and, or circumstances, uh, maybe no time or, or a little bit of money and you want to enjoy your home, you have somebody coming in and doing things like a gardener or something. How important is it to know what the gardener or somebody else, a pool guy or whatever, is chemically using in your yard when you start using stuff? Well, as a uh, veteran pesticide applicator of over 25 years, I'll tell you that there's not a pesticide that's applied in my yard that I don't know about. Yeah. I, want to, I want to know what the active ingredient is. I want to know what the label says. I want to know what the warning signal is on the, on the label, and I want to know what the MSDS sheets are, which is the material safety data sheet. Mm-hmm. And so in my personal home, um, I have a monthly pest control, and we never treat inside my house because I have a really successful exterior treatment service. So it's my wife doesn't like pesticides inside yeah. the house. And so we actually have zero pests, but we maintain our pest control on the outside so that we don't have pests on the inside. So some things that I think one should consider is that 50% of the 2 million poisoning incidents each year involve kids that are less than 6 years old. Wow. And 90% of those happen from pesticides that were left in the home. So think about that. I mean, that's an incredible statistic about how many kids get into poisons. It's not from professional pesticide applicators. It's from home applicators who leave pesticides unattended and unsecured. You know what, Michael? I'm guessing that if if somebody listening to the program right now goes into their bathroom, opens that opens a cupboard underneath, you know, where their storage cupboard, or goes in the kitchen and opens that space under the sink, that they're going to be absolutely flabbergasted at what they find. Well, here's a statistic for you with regards to that. Uh, among households that have children, this is in the entire USA, um, under the age of five, half of all of them have at least one pesticide product stored within reach of a child, usually oh in the my. kitchen cabinet. So that's half. And then 75% of households with no children have up to five sto- uh, pesticides within reach of the of children. Can you give and, us, Michael, maybe some examples of what some of them might be? Because I think that people see something and they don't really realize that that's what it is. 
Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one. It looks, it's in a brown, old-fashioned looking bottle. It's called Claudane, which is an organochlorine. Mm-hmm. And if you remember in your early days out here, Claudane was what was commonly used to control termites. And so there's a lot of Claudane around. People got it from work or wherever they got it from and, and kept it at home. And we've had probably every month or every three months or so, we'll have a customer who will say, listen, I've got a whole stash of Claudane in my garage. Can you guys use that when you do the treatment? Oh, my. And uh, so we tell them, look, you know, we're not going to touch it, and we'll tell you how to dispose of it. Okay, well, that's my next question, because I do know that you deal with this a lot. Gang, if you've got this situation going on right now, you got to cut this stuff loose. you got to say goodbye to it. And What's the best way to do that, Michael? What what can you do with something? Obviously, you don't want them to wrap it up in a paper bag and throw it in their garbage can. We'll take it. Uh, If if people have got a problem like that, give us a call. And and if we can't take it, and and what we'll do is we'll take it and take it to the Department of Agriculture. The Hawaii Department of Agriculture uh, will take that, and they won't assess any penalties or fees. Ah, No questions asked. So if you have a pesticide that needs to be um, disposed of, contact the Department of Agriculture pesticides branch and they'll be able to help you uh, get rid of it you're out, in the, you're, out the best the, way to do it. you're out in the north shore there's a lot of people out there that are semi-ag people there's a lot of people like to grow their own food and this happens uh throughout the state i would imagine that there are enclaves all over the place of really dangerous stuff that people really ought to be looking to getting rid of yeah you know one of the things that i, I you know what really saddens me is when you hear about pesticide misuse applications and melathion is a commonly used uh, um insecticide that's used on plants and that's often a pesticide that's misused you know you'll get a guy who's using it outside successfully and he'll say you know what? i've got a roach from inside let me go and spray inside my, mm-hmm. my kitchen cabinets with it and that's how pesticides get misused it's it's the people don't willfully uh, intend to create harm it's just they're just not educated enough to know the risk and so my advice would be do not use anything that's not in its original bottle or label. It has to have the label affixed. If there's no label on it and someone tells you that they think it is a, a certain pesticide, don't trust them. You know? uh, yeah, and you know the other thing you're is... you're responsible as the applicator. So, something else just, just came to mind. It used to be that if you know if you had your house painted, you'd, you, you, you'd you keep that paint around for 20 years thinking you're going to use it again down the road, and of course you're not. And of course nowadays, you know, almost all paints can be matched at a paint store and they can duplicate the color. It's no problem. You really should be getting rid of that stuff. And I'm guessing that there's residual chemicals in most people's houses or garages or storage cabinets. I would say you're, you're probably right. And the, the worst part about it is there's probably those pesticides inside food-grade containers with no label. Yeah, and so, yes. you know, people, they, they, they drop the can and it leaks or maybe the bottle... Uh, breaks and uh, they pour it into a, an, another jar, maybe an old food container or an old, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. And that's how pesticide uh, poisoning actually happens. A lot of times, kids will see something that's green inside a Gatorade bottle, and they'll think it's a Gatorade. Oh, right? So then they'll yeah. open it up. The Gatorade label still on it, but actually, it's some pesticide that might have been um, transplanted from another another vessel that got damaged. So um, you know, you know, pesticides must always be kept in the original container. Um, if they leak or break, get rid of them. Um, and uh, I would call Department of Ag. That would be the best way to get rid of those things. And, and don't store pesticides long term. They don't last forever anyway. Yeah, I was going to say that. Their shelf life isn't like uranium. How about this, though? I, I think this is important. Uh, how your folks apply stuff, you know, because they're so well trained to make sure that the families' homes that they're applying it at know what's going on. But more importantly, how are they trained and how do they protect themselves? Well, on the label of all pesticides, and we have thousands of options to choose pesticides, we always favor on the side of choosing the, the least harmful, least hazardous so, uh, pesticide because we want our applicators to be safe too. So mm-hmm. in the, for the most part, almost every pesticide we use doesn't even require PPE. Um, but generally, PPE is uh, personal protective equipment. The general PPE used for any pesticide application is long uh, rubber gloves, um, Long sleeves, long pants, or coveralls, um, rubber boots, and a respirator when mixing and handling. Or, or in, yeah, they look like space. Space. You guys look like spacemen. You know, what I mean, <laughs> they're 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 covered from head to toe, and that just tells you uh, how professional they are. I'll tell you what, we got coming up. Uh, I got to do a short little adjustment to our phone system here, and uh, when we come back after a short little break, we're going to get into uh, the 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 nuts and bolts of the show today, and that is selecting the best termite control situation. Termites are swarming. If you've got a problem, we've got the solution from Sandwich Owl coming up.
At Sandwich Isle, we believe the best way to protect your home from unwanted pests is not through control, but through prevention. Pest prevention is a unique concept perfected by Sandwich Isle in 1997. Over the years, we have continued to improve our service effectiveness with the many technological advances in our industry. Today, Sandwich Isle's pest prevention is recognized as one of the most environmentally responsible and effective approaches in the industry. Expect more and get it with Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Why do you need termite protection? My home is very important to me. Your home is your castle. My home is everything to me. Our customers want to protect their investment. That's why they hire Sandwich Isle to protect their home from termites. There are some homes out there that are going to get termites. You can spend thousands and thousands of dollars to repair damage. You need to protect your house, and Sandwich Isle protects ours. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it. And you can always jump online and check it out at SandwichIsle.com. That's S-A-N-D-W-I-C-H Isle.com. This show, What's Bugging You, was conceived by the owner, Michael Boffa, who's uh, hooked up with me today. And even though, you know, we've talked about a myriad of things on the show, Michael, the, the real big problem and the, and the dollar problem are these are these rotten, horrible termites. And there are some decisions to be made. You started telling us a little bit more about it. Maybe we can develop a little bit more today. But maybe trying to find out what is the best solution for each, each person's home. Well, you know, Mike, I, I think... Um Let's talk about subterranean termites <clears throat> and uh, which are the Formosan termites. And uh, so basically in Hawaii, we have two different types of termites that we need to consider as threats to our home. There's actually seven termites in Hawaii, mm-hmm. um, but there's only two that are really problematic. And, and those are the drywood termite, which um, commonly infest homes above ground, and uh, they infest dry wood and leave those little pellets kind of look like beach sand Mm -hmm. around. Yeah, that fresh you talk about, right? Fresh, yeah. 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 So um, those are the drywood termites, and those are typically handled by one of two means. One, uh, complete structure tent fumigation, where you completely envelop the house in in a giant tent, shoot in the gas, and then tent fumigate it. Take readings in the initial, or take readings at the at the terminal um, of the of the job. Make sure that you achieved your dosage goals, and then untent the structure. And so that's a hundred percent effective in one shot. The other option for that is to use orange oil, uh, which we couple with our borate treatment program, which is a great way to go for those who are more inclined to choose green products, as well as um, it doesn't require uh, the preparation or move out that that is necessitated by fumigation with the tent. So I, I, I have one question that might that might be addressed by two of the answers that you're just talking about, and and I know this is on a lot of people's minds. You talk about seven, you know, mainly seven different, you know, types species. of uh, species yep. of termites here. Is it common that my home or or somebody else's listening home has more than one issue? In other words, they have Boy, that's a good question. two or three or different. I mean, in other words, yep. there are a bunch of termites, but there's all kinds of different species as well. Mike, that's a, that that is a great question, and and. Yes. Um, you know how we normally end the show? We always say there's only two types of houses in Hawaii, <laughs> yeah, yeah. those with termites and those that will get termites. Yeah, we'll remind, well, them, we'll remind <laughs> them again about that in a little while. The, yeah. the, reason, the reason for that is because what you just said, the question you just asked, uh, the answer to that question is yes, most homes have both. And so um, just because you control drywall termites doesn't mean you've done anything to protect yourself from, from um, subterranean termites there and vice you versa. Know. So you, you have to have two things. There's two things you need in Hawaii. Number one is an annual inspection. If you're not getting your house inspected annually for termites, then you are going to have termite damage. That's, that's all there is to it. Because every time termites swarm, and like I said, in the last two nights we've had record-breaking swarms, um, every time they swarm, they, those are the, the males and the females, kings and queens, who hook up, they, they land on your structure, they find a little crack, they go in, they start having eggs, which become baby termites, and basically you, you, you start a new infestation. Three years to five years down the road, you're going to have termite swarms, uh, termite um, activity all over your house. Yep. And yep. so that, that's just the way it is. So in Hawaii, you have to inspect annually so you can identify if, in fact, you do have new colonies starting, and then you can take appropriate action. Um, but one of the things that's most important, I think, and I don't think there's a single structure, um, certainly on Oahu, but also many of the art islands have pockets where there's really very high termite pressure from Formosan termites. But if you don't have protection from subterranean termites, 
you're going to have some serious subterranean termite damage. This yeah, is that, well, that's what I was getting at because there's many people that have a, a treatment program, like as you know, I have had for years the Central Con treatment, uh, the Central Con system. Central Con system does it, 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 it works tremendously on the most common of the termites, right? But what about it's what about and termites? Does, yeah, does, does the Central Con help the, you know flying termites? So that's another good question because flying termites, people often call them flying termites. Um, it actually refers to all seven species. Oh, yeah, they all fly. I forgot <laughs> so they, that. Yeah. They all uh, swarm in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when you see termites swarming, um, an entomologist like myself can tell the difference between a drywood termite and, and a subterranean termite. But to the layman, they look identical. And so all termites swarm. Um, but you have two types, right? You have the drywood termite, then you have the, the subterranean termite. So mm-hmm. one of the the ways that we really like to... Um, go with the uh, subterranean termites is with the centricon termite baiting system because what's changed with it it's been around for boy i can't remember how many years it's probably close to 20 years yeah i've had it i think from the beginning um, it's wonderful yeah but the, but the stuff that your guys put inside has changed that's right it's called always active technology okay and so if you remember in the past <clears throat> when you place the centricon which is basically a it's a bait station that you place around your structure roughly every 10 feet around the house mm-hmm. it used to have a little piece of wood inside and then the technician would have to come out monthly, and he would inspect that wood, identify if there were termites in it, and then he would replace that wood with a bait, and uh, that way trick the termites into eating the bait. Mm-hmm. The problem with that was that it depended upon the technician um, always doing a perfect job on every station, and sometimes stations couldn't be found or whatever reason, he couldn't get out there that month, and then you could have a hit, and the termites would eat the wood and then leave, and you would never see them again. Um, so the company that manufactured it, Dow AgroSciences, they developed a program called uh, a, pr- a process called Always Active, where basically they put a the active ingredient inside every single station ah, right up front. Okay, so no matter what so happens now, mm-hmm. if there's a termite in there, they're going to take food home, and the food's poison. That that's exactly right. Yeah. So um, I've been involved in this, Mike, for over 24 years. I mean, I'm feeling kind of old right now, but I used to work <laughs> as a lab assistant for Dr. Rudy Sheffron and Dr. Daniel Sue in Florida when I was studying, and um, I used to go into the Everglades and collect logs with Formosan termites in them and Eastern subterranean termites, bring it back to the lab, break them out, and give them those termites that they could use it for research for this new bait they were trying to develop, which became Centricon. So I've been involved in this program before it even came on the market, Um, and it's fantastic. The new Always Active is just incredible, and uh, it's probably, if there was one thing you could do to protect your house from, from subterranean termites, I would say it's the number one thing to do. Michael, what about people that may have had a program before? There have been some companies that have that have left the business. Uh, there's there's certainly some people that maybe had good protection at one time. Uh, now there's just a skeleton of stuff left. I, is it preferable to come in and and just redo the whole thing instead of trying to Absolutely. reuse something? Just get rid of it. Yeah, you know the new the the new system with the always active technology is what you want. I wouldn't waste my time with the other stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, not even a chance of doing that. And and the pricing has, has come down so substantially um, because there's other competitive products out there that aren't even close. But nevertheless, there is competition for the company sure. that manufactures these baits. And so the pricing has come down. So today, you know, the, the cost of an average home is, you know, four or five hundred bucks to get Centricon installed. You know, so it's just incredible. It's all based on the linear feet and the number of uh, stations. You know, and, you know, and that's, why, that's why I was going to say the process that your training goes through for your folks is they're going to come out. I actually have in, in my yard, is, I don't know if you know this or not, but I have a couple of extra ones because I have somewhere on the other side of the lanai where there's like pool furniture and there's, right. and there's trees. So every now and again, uh, a p- the size of a piece of property or, or the types of stuff in it are going to dictate it being sort of custom made. Yeah, exactly. The, the key <clears throat> the key thing with Centricon, so how does it actually work? Well, consider this. The termites that are foraging around are actually blind. They're just mm-hmm. foraging wow. blindly through the soil, and these stations are, are placed in areas that they're optimally um, likely to encounter termites. And so termites love the top 13 inches of soil. So you place these stations about every 10 feet around your house, and it doesn't have to be in a, a perfect line. I mean, it looks better if it's in a line, but it doesn't have to be from a technical standpoint because just like you said, where you have them on the other side of your pool near the trees, yep. as long as you have a number of stations out there, you will encounter termites, and termites typically forage over about a 300-yard range. So Jeez, you'll encounter termites. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't matter where they are. They might mm-hmm. be under your neighbor's house, but mm-hmm. you'll kill them anyway. 
Um, and, and so that's the key. They basically randomly foraging through the soil, bumping the hedge into things. They find the bait, and then they eat it, take it back to the colony, and they regurgitate it through a process called trophallaxis, which is basically they poop it out, yeah, they, and yeah. they vomit it up. And that's how they feed the other members of the colony, including. Yeah, th- thank goodness we're not too much like them, you know. Yeah, I mean, how disgusting geez. is that? Yeah, so. but, but Michael, what what about this? I do know that this is pretty important to some people. Um, uh, the the way it's installed and the way it's done. I mean, you know, some some people, oh, this, uh, what are they going to shoot chemicals to the ground? What's what's this going to happen? Um, what sort of installation process is, or how does this how does this system get placed around my property? Okay, so typically what we do is, um, let's say the the linear footage around a property was the average in, on, on Oahu is about 240. So that would be 24 to 30 stations, mm-hmm. let's say. So what we'd do is we'd come out there and with a either a gas power drill or an electric drill, we'll drill into the soil, not through the concrete. Mm-hmm. We're going to drill into the soil uh, or use a T-bar auger, which is basically just a hand-powered drill, and uh, drill down 13 inches, pop out that, that core of soil, put it in a box so it doesn't leave a huge mess, and then push in the new... Centricon station with the recruit bait inside it, yep. so always active bait. And uh, then we just go ahead and move on and, and do the more. So an average home only takes a couple of hours. And, uh, Let, let's talk about let's talk about the system itself for a minute because the the one that I have it's really neat. There's these green things match the landscaping. I, I have mine in some areas where there's some decorative stones, and I have a little circle around it so the technician can see you know see where it is. Um, what about what about it being dangerous? I mean, you know, what about if I got little kids? Can I have central con and little kids in my yard? Um, absolutely. So basically, the active ingredient is an insect growth hormone. Mm-hmm. It specifically affects um, sub- or subterranean termites when they go through their molting cycle. It causes their exoskeleton. As they go through the molting cycle, they lose their hardened exoskeleton that might be damaged, and they replace it with a new one. Well, they first come out really soft and, and squishy, and then they start hardening. And then once they're hard, they can start walking, and then they've got this protective shell sure, around sure. them. Well, what this hormone does is it stops them from hardening. So they go through their molting cycle. When they get to the, it's not actually a poison; it's just a hormone, and so it causes them to never harden. So they just fall apart. And so, so no, it only affects them. It doesn't affect anything else. Well, I know there's a special tool that they use to take the tops off it and everything else. But you know, kids are pretty smart. And and, and what about pets? How how uh, uh, is, is the central con system being around the yard a problem if I got say a couple dogs outside? Not at all. You know, we've occasionally had a dog gnawing on a on a station, <laughs> and maybe even a dog know trying, yeah. trying trying to dig it up. But you know, being that it's an insect growth hormone, um, it doesn't affect mammals, and so there's there's uh, no effect at all. And in fact, um, the Centricon system actually won the Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge there Award, you go. There you which go. is the National Environmental Award that recognizes technical innovation that's environmentally responsible. So this this system is designed to prevent environmental exposure. Um, and it can be removed if you want to take it out. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I can tell you that real quickly because one day I was out doing some work in my yard and I found one, and then I, I looked at one of my dogs and he had that look on his face. <laughs> he knew. He knew what he did. <laughs> but I, ju- I just put it back yeah. in, no problem. Um, before we run out of time, I do know that you like to respond to people, and we had uh, an interesting mailbag question that sort of sort of fits right in with what we're talking about. It's about termites inside the house swarming. Yeah. So the question we received was. What can I do about thousands of termite swarmers inside my house? Okay, number one, if they're inside your house, get an inspection because they might be swarming from inside your house. Oh, boy. Which is a really bad situation. So if they're swarming inside your house, not from the outside in, <clears throat> then you probably have a nest inside and you want to have that checked out. So that's what I would do in that situation. If they're inside your house because they're swarming and they got in from the outside, well, the key thing there is to remove them. You don't want those termites inside your house because those are kings and queens that are looking for a mate and looking to start a new colony, and they would love to start that new colony inside your house. So let that be so, a warning, my friends. What about uh, uh, what's the best way to do this? I mean, where can we find out more cleaner. information? Well, just in that specific situation, Mike, I would use a vacuum cleaner and just vacuum them up. That's yep. the quickest, simplest way to do it. Um, and so that's what I always recommend to people. Vacuum them up, turn out your lights so that when they're swarming, have your doors closed and lights out so they don't come in. If you think you're lucky and you're going to dodge the bullet, give them the, the parting thought of the day. What's going to happen here uh, in, in my house? What are the chances? Well, if you don't, if you don't have termite protection, you will have termites. That's it. Yep. There's, there's no other option. Um, so termite control is a matter of... Uh, 
life and death. <laughs> you need so, to have it in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, there you go. A couple of types of houses, right? That's it. There's two types of houses in Hawaii, those with termites and those that will get termites. Always a pleasure, Michael. Thanks for being with us today, and we, we hope that people learn something and, and do a little something. San Rosal Pest Solutions is what you're going to do. You're going to call 456-7716. That's 456-7716. Or get right on the Internet at www.sandwichisle. That's sandwichisle.com. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. And if something is bugging you, jump online and get... The bug at sandwichisle.com. That's sandwichisle.com. Pretty simple. Thanks for being here. See you next time.